Great. Okay, so this talk is the first technical talk uh, where we're going to introduce some of the ideas behind mathematical modeling, how this works in practice, and what are the assumptions that are involved. So the goals during this talk are to understand what the natural history of infection means and how that's important for uh, understanding infectious disease dynamics. And then to understand a little bit about the most basic model of infectious disease dynamics, the SIR model. And we're also going to introduce the rep basic reproduction number, which is one of the fundamental concepts in infectious disease dynamics, as well as understand how we can use that to then calculate the proportion of a population you need to vaccinate to eliminate that disease from that population. And finally, we're going to talk about the importance of demography in understanding epidemics. Okay, so starting with the natural history of infection, you are a healthy person and somebody exposes you to a pathogen, an infectious agent that they have, it infects you, what happens? You don't get sick immediately. When somebody coughs on your face, you don't start coughing right away. There's an incubation period, the period between infection and when you become symptomatic. And then once you're symptomatic, you may have disease for some period of time, and we call that the duration of disease, clinical disease. You're sick. At the same time that that timeline's going on, there's another one that's very important. You get infected. You also can't immediately infect somebody else right after that. You aren't immediately infectious. You are infected and not yet infectious. And after this latent period, when you're infected and not yet infectious, then you start becoming infectious and you're infectious for some amount of time, the infectious period, aptly named. Okay, so these are different timelines and they do not have to match up. And how well they match up is extremely important for understanding how easy it is to control a disease. If people are infectious before they're sick, they don't know that they're spreading disease. It's difficult to control diseases like that, like HIV, for instance. However, when you get sick, and then start to become really infectious right after that, it's easier to control diseases like that. And Ebola is an example of a disease where you are not infectious until you're very sick. Okay, so in this context, we're going to start talking about a specific subset of diseases that are known as acute immunizing infections. Acute means the time scale of the disease is very short relative to the time scale of the host's lifespan. So humans, we live about 60, 70 years on average. Influenza you have for two weeks. Two weeks is much, much shorter than 60 years, so this is an acute disease. We're also going to be talking about immunizing infections, where in, the infection stimulates immunity through the production of antibodies, which lasts a long time, which means you will get the infection once in general, and then you'll be immune for the rest of your life. So this isn't true about all diseases, but we're starting with these diseases because the modeling is simpler. And so we always want to start simple and think about those cases as we, and then get more complex from there. And I should say I'm, I'm plowing ahead, but please do stop me if you have any questions at any point in the lecture. So what are, bless you, so what are some acute immunizing infections? So we have smallpox, which as Jim pointed out, we have eradicated from the face of the earth. Um, we have pertussis, also known as whooping cough, measles, chickenpox. Foodborne diseases are also often acute immunizing infections. So this is the type of disease we're talking about here. And a lot of these diseases you may think of as childhood diseases. These are diseases kids get and adults don't get. Why is that? Anyone? Yes. My Your name is uh, My name is Elijah. Thank you. I think because the kids, their immune system are not well developed as the adults. Okay, not developed in what way? Uh, they can't resist infections like the adults. Because the adults may have been exposed to some kind of infection before, so their immune system is well developed. Exactly. Well, it's, uh, not exactly. So adults have already had these diseases as kids. So it's a disease of kids simply because adults have already had it, right? It, it's not, if there's a population of adults that's never had the disease, they might get it too. And that used to happen, but it doesn't happen so much anymore because diseases spread all around the world very quickly now. So with this idea of the natural history of infection in mind, we can look for all these acute immunizing diseases and 
compare the incubation, latent, and infectious periods, and they're very different. And uh, based on knowing this information, we can already understand a lot about how difficult it might be to control disease, because what's important is when you get sick and when you're infectious, and how those time spans line up, and also how long you're infectious for. Okay, so some more terminology. We have this time span thing going on the right, telling us natural history of infection. Now we're gonna use some Venn diagrams to understand this a little further, okay? Green is exposed. Somebody has coughed on you, but you may not get sick, right? You may not even get infected, right? And exposure does not always lead to infection. So you can get exposed, but not get infected. If you do get infected, you might not be infectious and you might not be diseased or you might be infected and infectious but not sick, or infected and sick but not infectious, right? All these things are possible and they have different consequences for control. The first simplification we're going to make oh, is, did I go to? No. Is um, that we're gonna assume that we're not gonna think about the situation where somebody gets exposed and they don't actually get infected. We're just gonna think about exposures that actually do infect, okay? So we're, we're saying we're only thinking about exposures that infect, and that's equivalent to saying infectivity is one. The probability of infection given exposure is one. We're ignoring exposure. And then we're gonna actually not worry about symptoms and disease, which seems kind of crazy because that's why we're in this whole thing in the first place. We're worried about symptoms and disease, but that's not what spreads the infection, it's the infectiousness itself. So when we're modeling the spread of diseases, we often focus on the infectious period and not the clinical disease period. Not always true, but to keep it simple to start with, that's what we're gonna do. And, sorry. We're gonna go even simpler. We're gonna say, let's actually pretend we are in a world where as soon as somebody gets coughed on, they are infectious and they can spread it to somebody else. Okay, so you can imagine a disease spreading like that, right? I could infect somebody, they could infect somebody a second later, okay? So very simple, not necessarily realistic, but we're gonna see that we can still learn quite a lot from that. Okay, so we have this infectious compartment in our model, this in infectious circle. I'm gonna use this circle to represent the number of people that are currently infectious in some population, okay? So th the circle is a number, people, are, the number of people in that circle. Now we're also gonna consider two different compartments of people, the people who are susceptible to getting infected and the people who have recovered from infection and are immune because we're thinking about uh, immunizing disease, okay? So we have three groups of people and now we're gonna consider how they flow between these three different groups. They flow to the right, okay? If you're susceptible, you can become infected and infectious. And when you're infectious, and infected and infectious, you can recover. And then we're saying you have immunity for the rest of your life, so you stay there. This is fun. Okay. Now, the reason we are all here doing mathematical modeling is largely because of this dashed arrow, which is not a flow, but is an influence. The rate at which susceptibles become infected depends on the number of people that are infected. This is a dependency in the system. If nobody's infected, then that rate from S to I is zero for a disease that is contagious, right? So there's a feedback loop in the system, right? You can see that it might accelerate at least up to a point. And that is why mathematics is so useful in studying diseases, at least one of the reasons. Okay. We can use ordinary differential equations to study how the flow between these states plays out. And so we're gonna now start writing down some parameters that describe this flow. The flow from S to I is the transmission flow, right? It's the infection process. And we're gonna say that there's this parameter beta that we're gonna call the transmission coefficient. And we're gonna define that as the per capita contact rate, okay? So if this is a disease that's only spread by coughing, this is the rate per person per day that somebody is 
coughing, or the, the rate that a, a single person is coughing per day, and then times the probability of transmission given that they cough on somebody. Or you could think about it as the rate at which you get coughed on per person that's around you per day. And why do we multiply it by I over N? I over N is the proportion of people in the population that are infectious at a given point in time. N is the total population size, the total number of people in all the groups. So if you get 10 coughs on you on a, in a given day, but only three out of those 10 people are infectious, right? Not all of those coughs are infectious events. So we need to consider the proportion of the population that's infectious and the rate at which people are exposing each other. To get from I to R, it's a much simpler term. It's just the recovery rate, the rate at which somebody is recovering. And this has a very close relationship to the infectious period. The rate at which people leave I is actually equal to the average time they spend in I. So in this example, if infectious people recover at a rate of 0.2 per day, the average time they spend infectious is five days. Okay? And we're going to talk more about this uh, mathematical relationship throughout the course, but whenever you see a rate that is just a simple parameter leaving a box, you can say, oh, one over that is the average amount of time that people spend in that box. Okay? And now, importantly, this does not depend on anything else, right? The rate at which somebody recovers doesn't depend on what other people are doing. It's a process that happens without the dependence of other people. So with these parameterizations of the flows of the two arrows, we can actually write down a system of differential equations. The rate of change in S, ds dt is what that means, the rate of change in, in this, the size of this box over time equals the rate at which people flow out of S times the number of people that are in S. So we take this, multiply it by S. It's negative because they're leaving S. Okay, so this is the rate at which people leave S. The rate of change in I is the rate in minus the rate out. And the rate of change in R is the rate into R. Okay, so differential equations, some of you have more experience than others, but all it's doing is telling us the rate of change in a specific number, which is the state of um, a population. So the number of susceptibles or number of infected, for instance. Yes. Jeanette from the University of Maryland. I wanted to ask in uh, calculating the rate at which people move from S to I, I've seen in some places that they don't do it divide by N. It's not always I divide by N. And I've wondered why, why is that? Okay, yeah, great question. So the, sometimes people don't divide by N, and that is a different assumption about how people contact each other. I'm not going to write out the math here because of time, but later in the week we will do this. But if you divide by N, you're saying that the rate at which people contact each other in a population is independent of the density of that population. So in a town of 10,000 and in a city of 10 million, people have about the same amount of contacts per day in this model. If you don't divide by n, you're saying that the rate at which people contact each other increases with the size of the population. So there are different assumptions about the contact process between people. And, and we can show you the math behind that later. It's a good question. Other questions? Okay, so we've also mentioned we have this thing n, which is just the sum of s plus i plus r. And we can see that this is a constant population size because if we sum up the differential equations at the bottom, what does that equal? Zero, right? So dn dt equals zero. The rate of change of the total population is zero. So we have a, a system that's fairly simple. 
Constant population size, people can, can flow from susceptible to infected and infected to recovered. So with these parameters, we can now go and define this concept that we said was very important, R0, the basic reproduction number, also called the basic reproduction ratio. They're the same thing. R0 is equal to the number of infections produced by one infectious individual in a fully susceptible population. So imagine a, a city where nobody's ever had measles before. Nobody's immune to measles. Everybody's susceptible. And then one new person comes in with measles. R0 is the number of people they infect before they stop infecting people, either because they die, because they get better. It's the average number of people in that one infectious person would, would infect if everybody around them was susceptible. Let's look at what this looks like visually. Okay, so imagine you have this population of blue dots. One person is infected and infectious. If R0 is four, they expose four people, those four people get infected, then they recover and get immune. Okay, so this is what we're talking about with R0. And we can calculate R0 in this model by looking at what these parameters mean and how we defined R0, okay? So to get the rate, to get the number of people that that person infects before they get better, if we know the rate at which they're infecting people and how long they infect people for, we know the total number of people they infect, right? So the rate at which they're infecting people turns out to be beta. This is the total rate at which susceptibles are getting infected. But at the beginning of an epidemic, if only one person is in the I group and everybody else is in S, then S equals N minus one, right? S is basically N, so this cancels out, and I is one, right? So this whole term becomes beta. So that's the rate at which the infection process is happening. We assumed that everybody who gets infected will survive to become infectious because we don't have death in this model. So everybody gets infectious. And the average duration for which a person is infecting people is one over gamma. So beta over gamma is R naught for this very simple model. And it, again, the way you read this is the rate at which somebody is coughing on people, for instance, times the amount of time they're coughing. Per Any questions? So this is the basic reproduction number, and it's important because it tells us if an infection can start an outbreak. If R0 is less than one, an outbreak won't start, right? If, if I brought a new disease into this room, but didn't infect more than one person on average, and each of those people did infect more than one person on average, then people aren't replacing themselves before they get better with new numbers of infected individuals. If R0 is greater than one, then the epidemic takes off. So that's why we're so interested in this number. It tells us the propensity for a disease to invade a population. And this is a simple play out of that SIR model when R0 is less than or equal to one, you just never see the number of infecteds go up. But if R0 is greater than one, you do. So R0 is often talked about in mathematical epidemiology, but I actually think that the effective reproduction number is more informative and not talked about enough. And they're very closely related concepts. But then the difference is that instead of saying everybody is susceptible, we're now talking about a population in which not everybody's susceptible. So maybe some people are immune because they were previously infected or they were vaccinated. And the relationship is simply that our effective equals our not times the proportion of people that are susceptible. Okay, let's look at that visually. So now let's think about the same population, but instead of everybody being susceptible, half the people are immune because of, say, a previous epidemic. 
If R0 is still 4, what happens on average is that infected individual exposes four people, but two of them are immune and don't get infected. And so we get R effective of two, right? And that's, that was the simple math we did. We said R effective equals R0 times the susceptible proportion. So four times 50%, it's two. Why do epidemics peak? You got a preview of the answer. Yes? Um, Catherine, they run out of susceptibles. They run out of susceptibles. And why, why does that cause them to peak? Um, they are all moving to the recovered class, so they're, they're unable to get reinfected again. So when we talk about a peak, we're usually talking about the infected, something visible. Mm -hmm. So they will have to stop and go back in. Exactly. So we often look at this red curve to say, oh, okay, the infect, there's this big outbreak. It went up and then it went down. And for people not in this field, it's tempting to think something changed. Somebody came in and controlled the epidemic. The virus evolved to be less deadly or, or something happened. People changed their behavior. But what we often don't see is that behind all this, the proportion of the population that's susceptible is also declining over time. Susceptibles are fuel for an epidemic fire. If you don't have anybody susceptible, you can't have that fire. So it's actually true that at the peak of an epidemic is exactly when our effective passes one, right? It's the epidemic's growing when our effective is greater than one and it's declining when our effective is less than one. So this is why our effective is such a useful concept because it actually tells us in the course of an epidemic, what is happening and why. Okay, so our effective, the basic reprodu or, uh, uh, the effective reproduction number. If we look at this epidemic and we look at the susceptibles, we see it's falling over time. And our effective is R0 times the susceptible proportion, right? The susceptible proportion is changing over time. R0 is a constant. We actually know what R0 is. We can write it down in terms of the parameters of the system, beta and gamma. So we can also plot R0, or sorry, R effective over time. In this epidemic, R effective starts at R0, but it starts declining over time as the susceptible proportion goes down. And it makes sense that the shape of this is exactly the same as the susceptible proportion. It has to be, because r is a constant, right? And again, it crosses one where? Exactly when the epidemic peaks, okay? So when you see an epidemic peak based on this sort of um, susceptible exhaustion, you can think, oh, what's going on with our effective? What's going on with the susceptible proportion behind it? Because that's what's driving this. Any questions? Yes? Could you give a flavor of a, of a preview to why the uh, equation sometimes for, for mathematics background, the equation for R0 changes a little bit depending on what you're doing for the model. I know we don't want to get into depth probably at the moment about that, but it's not always the same equation. Sometimes you have to derive the R0 equation. So we're actually in this lecture going to do it at least one other way and maybe for two other models. So we'll get to that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so before we go to a slightly more complicated model, we can address this question. What proportion of a population do you need to vaccinate to make the disease completely die out? So for a long time, people thought that it was the entire population, right? If you don't vaccinate everybody, some people are still susceptible, they can still transmit, they can infect people. Why don't you have to vaccinate everybody to get rid of a disease? We can actually figure this out analytically based on this equation. For an epidemic to die out, our effective has to be less than or equal to one, right? We just showed that. So we can set this equation here to be less than or equal to one. We can do a little bit of math, divide both sides by R0. So we get the susceptible proportion needs to be smaller than one over R0. And what we'll say is the susceptible proportion, we're actually interested in the proportion that are vaccinated. So that's one minus the susceptible proportion, right? So what is the immune proportion um, 
such that this is true. So we take one minus both sides of this and we get the proportion you need to vaccinate needs to be greater than or equal to one minus one over R naught, right? Because when we do a negative, we reverse the inequality. And so we get the proportion that you need to vaccinate for R effective to be less than one is R naught minus one over R naught. Okay, you can, if this math, you didn't totally follow it, you can stare at it later, but intuitively, we can actually see this pretty clearly. If R naught is four, R naught minus one over four is what? Three quarters, okay? So what does that mean? So if 75% of the population is vaccinated, it means that this person who is gonna expose four people only su successfully infects one of them, right? And if each person only replaces themselves with one other person before they stop infecting people, the number of infected never goes up. Okay, so when you know or not, you actually know the proportion you need to vaccinate, in theory. It's not, there's a lot of more, more complexities in the real world, but this is a good first approximation. So the, in this case, our effective is one. And because we know or not for a lot of diseases, we can actually get a rough estimate of the proportion you need to vaccinate for each of those diseases. Measles, which is the most contagious pathogen we know of, has an R0 that maybe ranges between 15 and 20, depending on the population it's in. And so if it's 20, 20 minus 1 over 20 is 19 over 20. That's 95%. Measles, you need to have 95% of the population vaccinated to get it eliminated. That's very difficult to keep 95% of a population vaccinated all the time. But for something like mumps, where it's five, that's 80%, right? So knowing R naught immediately tells us something very useful about the proportion of a population you need to ha stay vaccinated to get rid of the disease. Questions? Yes. Catherine, how do you calculate R naught in the real world? Okay, well, we're gonna get to that as well, but briefly, um, there are a few different ways to do it. You can do it from time series data on how fast the epidemic's growing. If you know about how long it takes for one person bef before they get infected before they infect somebody else. So if you know those two pieces of information, you can do that. You can also calculate it if you know in great detail things about the contact rate. So if you know the rate at which people cough on people per day and how long they cough for and the probability that a cough is effective transmission, you can calculate it directly through that because it's R naught equals beta over gamma. So there, there are some different ways. Um, if you have genetic data and you can actually link infections and you have a lot of it, you can say, okay, this person actually infected four people and that's another way to get at it. So yeah, there are different ways, but it is challenging. Other questions? Okay. okay, so we have this model. We're now gonna make it slightly more complicated. We're now gonna say that people die. And we're not talking about death due to disease, we're talking about death due to other things, okay? Not the infection we're talking about. So people are dying at the same rate in S, I, and R. And so it could be from cancer, getting hit by a car, heart disease, all these different things. And we're also saying individuals are born. And we're saying everybody who's born is born susceptible because they've never been exposed. And so we just change our model slightly, right? We have minus mu s, minus mu i, minus mu r, and we've added births here. Okay, so pretty straightforward changes to the model. What does that do for the differential equations. Well, we have dn dt is equal to births minus deaths, right? And if we want a constant population to keep things simple, we can set the births equal to the deaths. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about a population where every time somebody dies, there's an infant that comes in and replaces them. Okay, so we don't have to worry about what population growth or decline might be doing to the system. And now, the only difference when we're calculating R0 is down here, okay? So before we had one over gamma, because that was the average duration of infectiousness. 
In this model, people can leave the I class in two ways. They can either recover or they can die. So the average amount of time people are infecting other individuals for is a little bit shorter because they might have got an influenza and then get hit by a bus the next day and therefore are not infecting people for as long on average. But the death rate due to all these other causes is much smaller than gamma, right? The rate of recovery. So this is pretty close to one over gamma, but this is telling us the amount of time people spend in I still, okay? So slight adjustment to R not beta over gamma plus mu. But we actually see pretty different dynamics, even though the r naughts are fairly similar. So now, if r naught is smaller than one, we get the same thing. We, the epidemic never takes off when we have that first person infected because they don't replace themselves with at least one other infection. But if r naught is greater than one, we get an epidemic that goes up and then goes down and then goes up and kind of reaches this stable level of disease. Why does that happen? Any guesses? Yes? Uh, yes. So the disease is not eliminated from the system completely. It's there, and maybe over time it could peak. But at least, um, yeah, the number will decrease, but it probably not going to be eliminated. OK. And, and why, why is it not eliminated now, but before when we didn't have births and deaths, it did seem to just disappear? What do you think is driving that change? The change didn't come again. So in this model, we have births and deaths now. And now we have a constant state of infection. What about the births and deaths is important to allowing the infections to stay constant? Because we're also assuming that um, the death rate is canceling out with the birth rate. Okay. Yeah, so, so we, have, we have people dying and they're being replaced by individuals who are susceptible. So we're feeding back more fuel into this fire. Before we were saying the epidemic ran out of susceptibles, there's no way for new susceptibles to come in the system. Whereas now, people are dying, and like you said, they're getting replaced by individuals who are coming in and susceptible. So that's why we can get this second epidemic. And that's why this blue curve, the susceptibles can actually go back up. In the other model, there's no way for it to go back up because S didn't have an arrow into it. Okay, so the effective reproduction number again is something we really want to always think about when we're looking at these plots of infection over time. And again, if we know the susceptible proportion, we can write down the equations for R naught and then R effective as a function of R naught and actually plot that too. And we see again that R effective starts at R naught, it goes below one, it hits one when the epidemic peaks and then it passes one again at the trough, at the lowest point as it's going back up. And once it passes one again, that's when the epidemic starts going back up again, right? That's exactly what our effective means. And then we can kind of see, oops, we can kind of see that it starts to stabilize around one, right? So this endemic equilibrium is when each person is infecting exactly one other person and it kind of reaches a stable point and that's just where it stays in the system. R effective equals one. Okay, but we don't see this in practice all the time. Sometimes we see data that look like this, where we get these huge epidemics that crash, and then we see them again. And so why do we get these recurrent epidemics? Well, during an epidemic, the number of susceptible individuals gets exhausted because we burn through all that fuel. But the disease doesn't completely die out because maybe uh, there are people infected in another town that bring it back over, or maybe we're in such a big city that even in these troughs, there's still one or two people infected. And then through birth or loss of immunity, we get new susceptibles and that builds up over time and we get a new epidemic. And we can see that vaccination 
which reduces the susceptible proportion in the population, seems to have changed the dynamics in the system. Yes? Um, in this graph, in this graph, it seems, okay, the first point is susceptibles become exhausted during an epidemic. But in real life, that doesn't happen. It's like if we had a measles outbreak right now in South Africa, it's not that every single child who's susceptible will get measles. There's some who <coughs> So it's not truly that epidemics die out because the susceptibles are exhausted. It's like there are other factors that come into play. Don't you think so? Yeah, I, I agree with that statement. So I'd say there's two, there's two points that you made that I think are both right. One, not everybody gets infected during an outbreak, <laughs> but you don't need everybody to get infected. You just need enough people to become infected, recovered, and immune such that our effective go lo goes below one. And so it's not everybody. It just has to go below one. And then the other point you made is that it's not just this that's driving things. There may be control measures in place. People may be changing their behavior, isolating cases, or doing other things that will change the dynamics in ways that maybe affect beta, for instance, the contact rate, or maybe gamma, how fast people recover and stop infecting other people. So it's certainly true that in the real world, many other things can affect it. But it's also true that the demographic dynamics of how many people are susceptible plays a very big role. Uh, so when you get measles in a place that's never had it before, like when the Europeans came to the Americas for the first time, everybody was susceptible and you, they had big epidemics that did then crash after the first year. Good point. Other questions? Okay. So we had this really simple view of the world, right, where we said that as soon as somebody gets coughed on, they can start infecting other people one second later. We know that that's not realistic. So let's make it a little bit more realistic where we say, okay, we know that there's this time period during which people are infected but not yet infectious. Let's still ignore disease, but let's actually include this period in the model. So we now have infected but not infectious and infected and infectious, which is kind of a, a lot of infect type words. So let's make it a little simpler. Um, we still have S and R, susceptible and recovered. And we generally use E for this infected and not yet infectious category where E refers to exposed. That is bad terminology. Exposed, we usually in epidemiology use to mean somebody who's been exposed, but we don't even know if they've been infected, right? They could have been exposed without being infected. Here we're using E exposed to mean somebody who's been infected, but is not yet infectious. So in mathematical epidemiology, dynamic modeling, if you hear exposed, be aware that it often means infected and not yet infectious rather than exposed and maybe you'll become infected, but we don't know yet. Okay, so we'll draw the same model. Now we have a new flow rate, which is from E to I, and that is the rate of becoming infectious. Kind of a confusing term, but if you remember, we said that the duration of time in a category is equal to the inverse of the rate at which you go out of it. So one over sigma is, is, is the latent period, the amount of time between infectious, sorry, between infected and becoming infectious. Okay, so if we know that, we can parameterize sigma. So same sort of thing, except now the individuals, when they get infected, go into E. And then from E, they have to leave and go into I. And the rate at which they do that is one over the latent period. We're going to assume constant population again to keep things simple. And now we're going to calculate R0 because we know that's important. And how do we do it in this model? OK, remember we said that there was this middle term, the proportion of people who get infected that actually become infectious, right? If I infect somebody in this room, and they get hit by a bus two days after that and don't live to become infectious to other people, 
we need to take that into account and are not, right? So the probability that they make it from arriving into E to arriving into I is the rate at which they recover divided by the rate at which they recover plus the mortality rate. So basically, the proportion of the total rate that they leave E that is becoming infectious rather than dying, okay? And the mortality rate we're seeing is very low, so this is very close to one, again, and this is just what we had from the previous model. Okay, so for the mathematicians in the room, when you see a system of differential equations like this, the, you know, okay, if I, if I want to calculate the equilibrium, what do I do? You can just yell it out. <laughs> set the equation to zero. Set the equations equal to zero. If we set all these to equal zero, then all the rates are zero, nothing's changing, and we can solve for S, E, I, and R, and figure out as a function of the parameters what the equilibrium in the system is. Okay, we're not gonna do that here, but it's good to be aware that you can do that. Um, we're gonna focus more on, on simulations and what we can get from that. And one of the things that you know if you've dealt with these kinds of models is that I will never actually approach zero. As in the simple SIR model, if you run this system of differential equations over time, it'll just get closer and closer to zero. Why in the real world does it actually sometimes get to zero? Yes? Stochastic events, chance events? Stochastic yeah. events, chance events. What does that mean? Um, they, it might be chance that this susceptible, like you said, we were talking earlier about how it didn't reach everybody in the population. It's a chance that that person wasn't mixing as well with the full population. Okay, so, so maybe on average each person infects two other people, but that means that sometimes they infect below average or above average, or maybe the last person who's infected dies suddenly, things like that. So there's this uh, seminal um, study that argued that for many infectious diseases, actually there is a critical community size that a population needs to be for the disease to never disappear from that population. And what they did is they said, okay, let's plot the size of a city in thousands. So this is half a million, this is 100,000. And let's look at the number of three week periods in those places where during those three weeks there wasn't a single case of measles, okay? And let's plot that versus size. They showed that for cities that were about half a million, there wasn't a single period of three weeks where they found no reported cases. Whereas for much smaller places, there were these fade outs. So stochasticity is important, it can go to zero, but in a city of 10 million people, even in the epidemic troughs, that means you might have 50, 100, 1,000 people infected, and so it might not ever get to zero. But in a smaller town, the equivalent proportion of the population infected may be 0.2 people, which rounds down to zero, right? So if it's just one person, it can go to zero very easily in a small place. And we can see that by using stochastic models, which Becky's gonna talk about tomorrow. Okay, so what accounts for epidemic cycles? And how am I doing on time? I, the light is blinding. <laughs> Let's see. Well, you got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, great. Um, so what did we say accounts for epidemic cycles? Why are we getting these epidemic cycles going up and then coming down? Yes? We said that we run out of susceptible population, and if the susceptible population is replenished, or people lose immunity, then the infection will go up. Great, okay. How often are these cycles happening here in this data? Every two years. Pretty much exactly every two years. Other than the people who were with Becky and I last week who know the answer to this. Why do you think it's exactly 
two years. Yes? Sorry? The incubation period? Okay. And how would that? Yeah, so it's a lot longer than measles' incubation period. This, this is measles, sorry if it doesn't say that. Um, but even if it was the incubation period, that would mean everybody would have to start the incubation period at the same time and have the same incubation period for it to be two years. Okay, yes? Your name? Emily from Ames. Could it be the development of a new strain, slightly different, and people lose, uh, are no longer immune after this two year period when a new strain has developed? It, okay, it could be. Why would that happen every two years? So it's based on the actual infection itself, right? So if, you've, if it starts as, I don't know, which one did you say this was? Sorry? Measles. Measles, yeah. It has one strain, and the actual measles itself takes uh, two years to, to adapt to now these immune people and change strain. This is possible. It would be interesting if, if it took the virus two years every time <laughs> to evolve, right? Okay. Yes. Your name. Uh, on, uh, does it have, this isn't exactly two years, but does it have a you know, like gestational period and like birth? Okay. Uh, just, I guess, if on average it takes uh, like nine months and then some time for a child to come. Somewhere. I don't know. So, something to do with birth. Yeah. Okay. So, we're on the right track here. Yes? Right, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's a blood Thank your name. Uh, I am Ams from the University of Madagascar. Uh, I think it's about birth rate, as uh, in two years there is an increase of the number of population which is susceptible, and there we uh, epidemic might uh, occur in this period yeah. every two years. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is how we started with the whole cycles thing, right? So it's amazing how we understand why epidemics go up and go down, but as soon as we look at cycles, we turn to external factors to try to explain it first, right? When actually it could just be the birth rate itself. Maybe it takes two years of the rate of birth at this level to have enough new kids who are susceptible to get an epidemic again, okay? And that's actually close to the whole picture, but two years exactly? That's a little weird, right? Like why, wh why wouldn't it be like 30 months? What are the chances it's two years exactly? Actually, what I was thinking doesn't make sense now that I think about it a little bit more. Uh, my name's Catherine, but I was thinking it might have to do with the school year cycle that kids are getting into school, but that happens every year, not every two years. But actually it does make sense. So that is the other piece of the puzzle. So well done. Okay, so. Let's, let's build this into a measles model. Let's throw numbers on it, okay? We can fish around the research literature and figure out, okay, people are infectious with measles, let's say, for about five days. So they recover at one over five days. Takes them about eight days to actually get infectious after infection. Let's say people live for 50 years, okay? So in years, the rate of death is 0 0.02 per year. And the birth rate we're going to make equal to mu times n, right? So they perfectly balance. So now we have everything we need to run this model except beta, right? What is the rate at which people are contacting each other? Let's say we'll guess it. We'll, we'll, we'll guess it based on some knowledge about R0 in the system because we know how to write R0 as a function of everything in this model. So if we know R0 from other people's research, we can estimate beta. And let's say beta is actually changing the way Catherine suggested annually. Let's just make it a simple sinusoidal change. Okay, so beta looks like this in this model. It's going up and going down. Now let's look at a model that can re yes. Go ahead. Sorry that I'll be taking but the function I used for beta function is that it's a sine wave. Like sine yeah. uh, also sine just sine t. Yeah, it's, it's a sine wave that has the period set to be a year. So between every peak is a year. And the amplitude, we've set it 
we've kind of tweaked it. We've guessed how big of a difference in the contact rates there is between when kids are all in school and when they're not. And we don't know the exact answer in the real world, but um, you can play with it and then see how you can recreate the dynamics. Good question. Okay, so we've, we've done that. We've got this. Um, okay, so we've, we've got this S-E-I-R model with births and deaths, and we've recreated these epidemics every two years in this model. Okay, and now when you see, remember, an I-curve from a model, think about what's going on underneath it with our effective. So we plotted our effective over here, right, which is also on a two-year cycle, but it looks a little funny, right? There's this little blip. Okay, so our effective, when the epidemic peaks, right, reaches its trough, or sorry, re hits one over here, and when it's down at its lowest is when it's declining the fastest, and then at its trough, it passes one again, and then increases back up, okay? So what's going on here is that there are two processes underlying our effective that are combining to give two-year cycles. What are those two processes? Birth and schools. Okay, so let's look at the two of them. So the birth, or the, yeah, the, the school is easy because we put that in. We said it's annual. The susceptible proportion is dropping during an epidemic and then it's growing slowly and it's growing slowly as a direct function of the birth rate in this system. The rate of turnover from when recovered people are replaced by susceptible people. And we've set that parameter based on the life expectancy in the system, right? The life expectancy tells us the birth rate. So if the life expectancy is 40 years, that means the population is turning over quickly, more quickly than if the life expectancy was 100 years, right? People are living longer, so we have infants coming in more slowly. So what happens to this model if we then change the life expectancy to be 50 years? A little bit slower turnover. Let's see what it does. We still have biannual epidemics, right? Every two years, but they look a little different, right? They're a little shorter, they're a little smaller because after two years, we don't have quite as many new susceptible kids to have an epidemic. What about if we make it 60 years? All of a sudden we shift into annual epidemics, but they're much, much smaller, okay? Now, if you think about the situation where the life expectancy was incredibly long, we would expect this to match the green curve, right? Because it would be driven mostly by the fluctuation in beta. So that's what's going on. As the turnover rate in the population gets bigger, that is playing a bigger role in shifting it away from these annual cycles driven by the school term. So the reason it's exactly two years is because maybe it would have taken 30 months to have enough susceptibles or 22 months, but because of the annual school term cycles superimposed on the demographic turnover, we're getting two year cycles. So again, demography is really important in understanding infectious diseases. If you think about what was going on for a 50 year period in London, one of the biggest cities in the world, there are epidemics every two years. Now imagine you're in charge of public health in London and you don't know why that's going on, which people didn't know until about two decades ago that this was what was driving those two-year cycles. A big epidemic happens, you freak out, and maybe you throw a bunch of resources at controlling it, and then the next year there's no epidemic and you pat yourself on the back. You save the day. Right? No. Actually, it's predictable that you aren't going to have a big epidemic after the last one. Right? And so if you know this sort of thing, then you can prepare for it. And now we understand the dynamics of disease much better, so we know that the susceptible proportion is playing a big role in these sorts of cycles. And for a current day example of that was Zika in Central and South America, 
the places that, that got hit really hard last year aren't going to get hit hard <laughs> next year because 50, 60 percent of the population got infected in one big wave. They're immune. There is not enough susceptible fuel for another outbreak in those places. So spending a lot of effort on those specific places on control may actually not be cost effective, but maybe another seven, 10 years down the line, there might be another big epidemic. We don't know exactly when, but we can understand that based on the amount of immunity in a system, it's gonna affect the probability of a big outbreak. Okay, so in summary, the late and infectious periods drive epidemic timescales and also affect how easy it is to control a pathogen. The basic reproduction number, R0, is a threshold parameter for whether an epidemic can take off in a system. If it's greater than one, it can take off. If it's smaller than one, infected individuals aren't replacing themselves. We can use R0 to calculate the proportion of a population that needs to be vaccinated to make the disease die out. And that's R0 minus 1 over R0. So as soon as you know R0 for a system, you can just do that calculation quickly. If it's 2, 50%. If it's 10, 90%. And susceptible replenishment drives periodicity in epidemics. The rate at which you get new susceptibles through birth or loss of immunity or immigration, something bringing new susceptibles into a system is one of the major drivers of when you will have another epidemic. Any questions? Yes. Um, can you slide back, you were showing how you pulled some values for parameters from the literature, and I'm curious in, to be publication quality enough to go to policy making, which is something we'll do by the end of the clinic, what are some of the protocols for kind of going for this? Do people try to get the widest range, a, a systematic lit review and get the widest range possible and you know, play along with those ranges, or is it sufficient, and maybe it varies by mathematical literature versus policy and epid literature, is it sufficient just to get a reasonable value? Um, I'm kind of curious how to, how to apply yeah, that. <laughs> that's a really good question. So the, the answer depends on what your research question is. It, so for what we just did, um, we could show that this type of susceptible replenishment can cause biannual epidemics. And I think to communicate that to policymakers, it, it's a pretty clear mechanistic explanation. They might not care that our epidemics aren't the same peak as what was going on, but it still gives a qualitative intuition for an answer that's very important to a question that's very important. But if we then want to go and say, well, this is the proportion of the population you need to vaccinate and start getting specific numbers, they're gonna want more specificity with the numbers we put into the model and where that comes from and also sensitivity analyses for things that were uncertain. Um, so it, it really does depend. And if you're trying to show a qualitative dynamic versus trying to give specific guidance, that will play a big role. Sometimes the numbers don't exist. And so you really are stuck doing sensitivity analyses to say, well, across this wide range, my answer is the same. And that means you, you still can give good guidance.